My name is Ronan Conway and I am from Cork and I travel over today from Dublin. I'm just going to give you a small sense of who I am and then I'm going to jump into the reason I'm here today as well. Yeah, I grew up in Bishopstown, Cork and I was one of these young people, uh, teenagers that was running around Bishopstown with a hurley in my hand, in a, like an extension of my arm. I used to bring it to uh, the shop, I used to bring it to school, I used to bring it to bed actually for a couple of years. Hurling was a huge part of my life. Um, I finished playing hurling a few years ago. Um, actually, it must have been 10 years ago, actually. So when I, when I finished playing hurling, there was definitely a, a big gap in my life because it, uh, it was my main passion for many years. When that happened, I was looking for something to fill that void in many ways. My buddy, Gizzy Ling, some of you might know who Gizzy Dermot Ling is from Wexford. He gave me a call 10 years ago and he said, there's a new organization being set up called the SOAR Foundation, um, S-O-A-R. <laughs> but um, has anyone heard of SOAR? Maybe a few people, yeah. So SOAR was set up by a guy called Tony Griffin from Clare, um, and Carl Swan as well from Dublin. And um, so it's, what SOAR do is they travel around the country and they run self-esteem resilience workshops for teenagers. Um, I went along to a workshop 10 years ago that Tony ran and to be honest I fell in love with it and I knew straight away that this was what I wanted to do, this is where I wanted to pour my energy into. So for eight years I travelled around the country from Dublin, so all around the country to secondary schools, going into transition, year school, transition years and running three hour workshops, so interactive workshops whereby teenagers get an opportunity to have courageous conversations. So what that looks like is exploring who they are, who they want to be, and also getting a chance to teach each other a few lessons about what life as a teenager is like, okay? Um, over the course of those eight years, it was almost like I got a, a sneaky look behind the curtains as to, as to what teenagers are going through what's great about being a teenager, what are some of the challenges. And it was a real honor, to be honest, it was a real privilege. Uh, I would not have stayed in a job eight years un unless, uh, un unless it actually gripped me so much. And um, yeah, I can't say enough about, about SOAR. Um, yeah, so what I want to do t today for this next 25 minutes, okay, is to simply share with you what teenagers taught me in that eight years. Um, but also offer to ye, the coaches, who are on the cold face working with teenagers, offer ye some suggestions and tips as to how ye can integrate the learnings into your day-to-day -day environment. Now, with a huge asterisk next to that comment, ye are already doing probably a lot of these things that I'm gonna tell ye, okay? So you're probably already doing a lot of these things consciously or subconsciously. I want to tell you a story first. I just want to paint you a picture as to what SOAR looks like and feels like because it's probably a bit abstract. Ten years ago when I started working with SOAR, um, I was with Tony Griffin. We went into a workshop um, and in a tough enough school to be honest. We, I went in, opened the door. I hadn't been in a school since I was in school. So when I walked in uh, to, the, to the, the group, there was like 50 people in there. The place was going bonkers, right? Um, mixed school, uh, they, there were people strewn across the tables listening to music, there was people throwing school bags. Um, if you were a movie director and you wanted to create a scene uh, of disengaged teenagers, this would be the perfect scene. Um, so I went in and I was unbelievably nervous standing in front of the teenagers. And I did my introduction, Tony was next to me, and I was like, hi, my name is Ronan, and I'm from Cork, and my heart was beating so fast. And uh, this guy shouts from the back of the class, and he goes, you Cork rat. I shouts it, and I'm like, oh, Jesus. Completely stopped me in my tracks. And like, you could hear the venom in his voice, he, he really meant that, like, you know, seriously. <laughs> and. Uh, so I was like, I was thinking of packing up and leaving. Honestly, I, was, I didn't know what to do. So uh, another facilitator with us that day said, he just stood in front of them and he said, 
Um, so we're about to pack up and leave, but you know what? I'd like to offer you something. I believe that within this room of teenagers that there is a huge depth of experience and wisdom and knowledge. And I believe that you can teach each other so much about life because you've learned a lot about life. And he said, I'd love to give you an opportunity to actually do that today if you're game. Or you can continue taking the piss and having a bit of crack. What do you want to do? Um, there was awkward shuffles and silences uh, until the guy that called me the cork rat piped up at the back and he kind of looked around and he was like, yeah, I'll do it, yeah. And uh, I said, oh, I said, it's all yours. And he said, yeah, I like DJing. He likes DJing. I was like, oh, very cool. Why do you like DJing? And he said, because it kind of, yeah, it's a distraction and it gets me away from some of the uh, challenges of life. He started talking about who he was when he went home, right? So he raised, he raised all his younger siblings and he also takes care of his dad, right? He did take care of his dad. And he started speaking so authentically. He took off the tough guy mask and he spoke really authentically. Um, and the whole atmosphere of the group changed, right? It went from chaos to silence. People started taking out their headphones. People started sitting differently, and they're like nodding and humming and just going, yeah, OK. So for the next two hours, a really natural conversation happened whereby people just started speaking about their lives beyond the school. At the end of the workshop, they left feeling galvanized. They left feeling understood, and they left feeling with a huge sense of empathy for, for their team or for their classmates. It was a magic feeling. So three things that I would have uh, learned from that, OK, is that where the whole thing shifted on that day when my facilitator asked him a different question was, the reason it shifted is because the teenagers, one, they felt in control, OK? So they felt like they were the teacher. Secondly, they felt really seen and heard and valued. So they were like, OK, so you actually want to hear what I'm saying. Okay, they felt that, but also they felt safe enough to actually share about a bit more about who they are. Okay, um, still with me? Lovely. Uh, so, with that introduction, you might be wondering why the hell there's a, a picture of soil with seeds. So, you guys as coaches, you're in a position whereby you can create environments for teenagers to grow and to learn, OK? So I've, I, I have an image in my mind that you're, in some ways, you're kind of like gardeners. So you're, you're, create, you're making the soil fertile enough for the teenagers to grow and learn, OK? And what I learned that day in that school is that when the conditions are right, teenagers will jump in and engage willingly, OK? Now, I've got six points to share with you, six points as to how I think you can integrate it in. As I said, you're probably already doing a lot of these things anyway. But here we go. So psychological safety. Give us a wave there if you've ever heard that phrase before, psychological safety. Go. So what psychological safety is, is the belief that you have when you walk into a room that you can contribute as yourself freely without punishment, slagging, repercussions. So at the start of that workshop with teenagers, they didn't feel safe. By the end of it, they did feel safe. I want you to imagine that if you were going on a bus journey with uh, some teenagers for, for a game, to an away game, and say a girl stands up in front of her uh, teammates and she starts singing a song. And then she's met with laughter and jeering, OK? What do you think is going to happen to safety levels? Her level of comfort is going to diminish, OK? And then when they go on the bus journey the next time, what's going to happen? She's not going to sing, OK? If you're in a meeting and someone asks a question and it's a stupid question and people laugh, same thing's going to happen. Same thing when you're on the pitch and someone messes up and you berate someone, your level of safety diminishes. So. The reason I say that is, when people feel psychologically safe, 
so even today, you're all in the room, okay? So when you walk in and you feel actually safe, psychologically safe, that you can be yourselves and contribute today, our whole physiology changes, our body relaxes, we become less anxious, um, and also we're more, um, we're more likely to actually engage in what you're doing, instead of worrying about, oh shit, can I say this, or dynamics. Does that make sense? Okay, nice. So I'm gonna move on to the next slide, belonging. Yeah, so we have a couple of hunter-gatherers there. The reason I have that is, until 10,000 years ago, human beings lived in hunter-gatherer tribes, okay? Um, which, a sense of belonging to a tribe for 99% uh, of human history, it wasn't something that was, we did for the crack. It was like, oh yeah, a bit of belonging. It was actually something that we needed. So everyone in this room and every, everybody has a hardwired need to belong to a group. Um, there's a book called Culture Code, and uh, it talks about when we walk into an environment, we're constantly scanning our environment to answer the question, do I belong, okay? Even when I came in here today, and I'm sure some people uh, might relate to this, subconsciously we're looking to see who do I know, or does someone have the same uh, jersey as me, or we want to know if we belong, okay? I'm gonna give you an example. Um, when I was growing up in Bishopstown, there was a coach called Padraig, and he coached me all the way through teenage years. And I remember this, every time I used to come up to the club, not just me, everyone, but when I walked into the GA club, he'd be like, Ronan, right? And he'd turn his body and he'd look at me and he'd say my name every single time. Um, that was giving me cues. He was basically saying to me that you belong here. So for this part, eye contact, body language, using someone's name, all of these things are switching lights on in teenagers' minds, basically saying to them, you belong here. Can anyone think, uh, and I'm not gonna actually ask you to speak in front of the group, right, but give me a wave if you can think about somebody that was maybe a coach or a mentor for you growing up that made you feel like you belonged in your environment. Give us a wave if, if you can think of someone. Very nice, cool, very good. Um, yeah, and just on that before I go to the next slide, I love using the clicker, by the way, it's very cool. Um, is that what I l learned from working in schools of teenagers is that they pick up on your energy, right? So it's an energetic thing as well. It doesn't need to be eye contact or your words. It's how you make them feel, you know? So like everyone in this room is gonna do it differently but it's actually just making someone feel seen and heard. Um, and it, it's uh, one of the words that was on the thing there was commitment a while ago. If you want young people to commit, I believe, you help, you help them feel like they belong. Um, if you want them to create and you want to build a sense of resilience, um, you make them feel like they belong. Um, think of that image of every time you give someone a cue, that they belong, you're switching on a light in their mind. So it's your job as a coach, every time that you come into the environment, to keep those lights switched on for all the, for all the young people. Big job, but it's a, it's a lovely opportunity for you. And um, yeah, boom, why? Teenagers want to know why they're doing something. So Anya said it really beautifully around two hours ago. She said, helping people understand your intention and the why you're, you're doing something. I remember playing GA myself, and sometimes I'd go up to the club, and you'd go training, and you'd do the drills and games and stuff, and you'd never stop to think, why am I doing this? What's the point of this drill? Um, I've seen with teenagers in schools that when they don't understand why you're doing something, they think you're bossing them around, or they might think that you're ordering them uh, just to control them or something. So the best, one of the best things I've learned working with teenagers is like, let them know why you're doing something. I'm gonna give you an example. Uh, I work with sports teams at the moment, and a coach rang me a couple of weeks ago, and she said, um, I put 
a message into the WhatsApp group to the girls, and no one's writing back. She was trying to uh, organize an event. And I said, OK, so do they know why you're doing it? And she said, no, uh, I presume they do. So I said, tell them why you're doing it. So she put in an audio note into the group, and she said, girls, I'd love you to reply. The reason I'm actually organizing this event is that I care about you. I want you to have a night out after, uh, or, or a nice time together after the pandemic. And uh, I'm, doing, I'm doing this for you. And she said they just flooded back in because it clicked that, oh yeah, they're, they're, her intention is pure and it's good. Ownership. Sometimes it feels like teenagers are on the back of the bus and the, the adults are driving, okay? And that's, that's understandable and uh, also it's a safe thing. You would not have a teenager driving a bus. I'm not telling you to do that. But in terms of taking responsibility and taking the lead in environments sometimes, sometimes it feels like the adults and the mentors uh, can, like, this is how you're going to do it. They'll like, go off and do it, okay? What I have seen work really well in, in schools as well is putting the teenager in the driving seat for certain times. Okay? What I mean by that is if you're organizing an event uh, or uh, you're maybe deciding what colors to pick for the next training kit, okay? imagine giving the responsibility to the teenagers to say, we want you to decide. We want you to vote. I have seen teenagers stand taller when that happens. They take responsibility. Um, and they grow into the shoes that you're giving them. So if you're giving them bigger jobs, I have seen teenagers literally stand differently when you put the responsibility in their hands. Just like what happened in the school uh, when we said, you're going to teach each other now. Actually, I do have one more thing on that. When you're in meetings, Okay, so I suppose I am definitely going to say this because I facilitate conversations with people. But another way to give responsibility and ownership to young people is, say for example, after a game, you're wondering what went well and what didn't. Instead of you saying it to them, giving them the responsibility and saying, what do you think you did well? And what do you think you could have done better? Um, that creates a sense of respect, mutual respect with each other. It's like, I actually respect what you are going to say, and I know that you have something to say. Now, I'm going to get a big asterisk for this. The first time you ask a group that, there, you might be met by a big wall of silence and awkward shuffles. Trust me, when you, when you expect that there's an answer there, which there is, sit in the silence and wait for it. It will come. You just need to be comfortable to sit in the silence with them. And once it comes, just get curious. Get curious. There's, they have so much. The thing is, they have so much to say. When I walk into groups of teenagers sometimes, there is so much wisdom and knowledge in a group of teenagers that when they're asked the right question and you use the right keys, that's where you can open, open it up. But they need to be asked. Role modeling. So role modeling, like this is kind of a, sometimes when you're in front of teenagers and you probably know that, they're watching everything sometimes. And they're listening to everything, even though they mightn't look like they are, but I found they are. They're like sponges and they're taking in the elders, which is us, how they are and how they're interacting with others and uh, just the way they are. So, <laughs> If you want them to demonstrate respect and um, authenticity and honesty and hard work and so on and so forth, it's obviously understandable that we'd need to role model those behaviors as well, you know? So in our interactions with coaches, referees, uh, and all of the young people, not just some of them, all of them. Now, you're probably looking at me thinking, yeah, of course we do that. But it's good to reiterate that anyway. Um, they're watching, and it's monkey see, monkey do kind of situation. Um, on that, you don't need to be perfect. That's what I've learned as well, is that teenagers are not looking for you to be perfect. They're actually looking for you to be authentic. 
which is a lovely way to get out of trouble sometimes because sometimes I've like stalled in workshops with teenagers and I don't know what I'm going to say next and what's going to happen next. And sometimes it's nice to just go, I actually don't know what I'm doing now. I, I really don't know where I'm going to go next. And they're like, oh yeah, cool, nice, all right. He's a, he's a human being, so use that one if you want, if you're ever in trouble. Um, yeah, so they're not looking for perfection, they're actually just looking for you to be, to be authentic, I believe. And then last one is connection. So I heard a lovely word recently, which I always remember, it's liminal, okay? So a liminal space is a space like a waiting room or a car park. It's somewhere an in-between space, okay? It's somewhere where you wouldn't spend too much time usually, unless you like hanging out in car parks or waiting rooms. But teenage years is also a liminal space. It's a liminal period of their lives. So they're not kids and they're not adults. And as I was preparing this, I was singing the Britney Spears song, I'm not a girl, not yet a woman. Anyone know that? Okay. Um, so they're in a liminal period of their lives, okay? For the last two years, for the last two years, their liminal space, their teenage years have been prolonged because they haven't had the opportunity, a lot of them, to go into schools and to start building their emotional intelligence, reading facial expressions, trying on new personalities and masks and way of being as teenagers should, okay? So they've kind of, it's not like that hasn't been there for two years, but it's certainly been diminished, those opportunities, okay? So the reason I'm saying connection is the news has probably told us in the last two years, not just teenagers, but us, that the world is unsafe. Subconsciously, that's a message that we might have gotten, okay? So I feel the GA and you guys are in such an amazing position to restore that sense of trust with teenagers that the world can be a safe place. Um, and how I, how I would recommend that is rebuilding those relationships and connections that they have with each other and with their club, with the elders in the club, uh, with ye, okay? So you can do that, you can do that on the pitch, you can do it in the dressing room, you can do it um, around the club, okay? But how about this as well? You can do it through games nights, you can do it through uh, quizzes, you can do it through interviewing a local legend or whoever that is. You could do it through camping on the pitch in the GA uh, in the summertime. You could do it through walking a hill together, okay? It's basically creating memories for teenagers whereby in 10, 15 years time, they'll look back and go, holy beep, that was unbelievable. Wasn't that a really, really great time that we had together? And going back to the other point is, include them on the process. Say like, we want you to build connection again. What do you suggest? Put it in their court and see what happens. Um, yep, there you go. Yeah, nice. Uh, I ha you see, I have a mental script in my head that I'm reading whenever I go into my blank. <laughs> So what, what, I know uh, it's been a, a long day for you, and it's also uh, cold outside and all that, and I know people might be on the, looking forward to getting on the road, but before you do, I just want to try, try something with you, is that, you know, I spoke about my coach, Padraig, the guy who made me feel like I belong when I was in the club. So if you're comfortable and you're up for trying something different, I'd love you to think about a coach or a mentor uh, that you've had in your life, maybe your early life, that made you feel like you belong, okay? Or they made you feel uh, empowered, or maybe they feel, made you feel like a bit, a bit taller uh, in yourself when you're smaller, okay? So have a go, pedal through your mind and have a think, okay? And as you do, I'd love you to think about the quality what was the quality that they had? So what was the key quality that you think they had? Cool. Um, and now I'm going to up the stakes a small bit, if you're game for this. 
I'd love you to turn to the person next to you. And I'll, what I'd like you to do is exchange what the quality was that they had. Cool? We'll give 30, 40 seconds for this, and then I'll come back to you. So go for it, if you're up for it. By the way, thank you for doing that. What I'd love to do, if you're up for this, is I'd love to hear from one or two people uh, what quality was. He was inspirational. Yeah. He gave us his time. Yeah. His energy, his enthusiasm. Brilliant. He was a Christian brother. Yeah. He lived in a monastery in a very barren room. Yeah. And he had so much to give. Yeah. And we fed to those children. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we feel today as adults. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. And what's your name, just last question? John. John, nice, nice to hear from you. Inspirational. Throw your hands up if, you, if your word was something similar to that. Inspirational. Oh, cool. I'd love to hear from one or two more if, if you're okay with that. Uh, anyone want to share it? Instead of me asking people, is there anyone that just wants to share what the quality was? Yeah, go for it. My name is Noel, I'm from, from Limerick. Um, yeah. You might have heard of Limerick there before, but uh, <laughs> we, um, a coach actually listened to what I was saying. Yep. Like, he, asked, he asked questions and he actually listened to us as a group. Uh, before a lot of time, we'd been used to coaches, you come in, <clears throat> uh, he says you do your three laps and away you go, and then you, you, you don't know whatever he asked that. But this coach who came in in particular started listening to what we as players look for. A bit like what you were saying earlier about, about the why. Yeah. Why are we doing stuff? Why are we doing this? But his explanations and his ability to listen to us, whether he took great heed, but we felt he listened to what we were saying. Cool. And uh, it made the sessions way more enjoyable. We were an under-21 group that just didn't, um, just for a group that liked, liked playing games, but he just listened to what we were doing. <clears> and it just felt that you were part of the sessions more. Even if you weren't getting on the team, you were actually part of the sessions. And Brilliant. that group stayed together for years after that like but that, that was the start of it he first Brilliant. coach i remember actually questioning the players yeah. was, what why, why are we doing this and he listened rather than saying away well, you go do your laps i'm the coach yeah, yeah. you're the players wow yeah, that's yeah. L lovely man yeah. thanks for jumping up uh very good um and yeah i maybe two more people uh and throw your hands up if you said something like you felt heard or they listened anyone have anything like that no Cool. Maybe two more people. Uh, I'd love to hear from you if you're game. Yeah, nice. What's your name, actually? I'm Alba. Alba? Oh, yeah. Um, nice. Always nice to hold a microphone. Isn't it? Um, so the one I said was that they were laid back. Yeah. So very like the last man said there that it wasn't just straight in. It wasn't, like, even though we were playing, like, competitive levels and things like this, it was at the first start of every first five minutes of every session, it was well, how'd you go? I heard you had an exam. How'd it go? Or, yeah. God, your dog was sick. What's the crack there? Yeah. That there was time for a chat that he actually did. Like, keep uh, up to date with your life, kind of, yeah. rather than just, okay, let's go, get the ball. Come on, so why would that, tell me this, why would that be important that someone would actually care about what you're doing beyond uh, sport then? So, like, would, do you, why, why do you think that would be important? Well, I suppose it's so that, like, for us, I suppose, because we were teenagers at the time, that it was, that if we did have a problem in the future, we could go to them and just say if something happened mm. at home, we could say, Look, remember a couple of weeks ago I came in and this happened, I'm actually not feeling too well today. Yeah. I'm just going to, you know, give it a go. But So just that they, you know that you can have a, an honest conversation with yeah. them without being under pressure to perform. Cool. Or Class. Nice one, Alva. Great to hear from you. And we'll go for one more. This is great. Thank you. Uh, can I go for you? Just two down, actually, who I asked a while ago. Yeah. If you're, if you're game. Do you want to put it over there, Roy? Nice one. Just for that personality to make you feel safe when you were there. Yeah, personality. Yeah, so safety yeah. as well, yeah? Cool. Do you want to well, do you want to tell us one more? One more? Yeah. Are you, yeah, throw it on, throw it on. We won't get to everyone. Last one. <laughs> um, I remember a coach and I just felt very, I felt that he had a huge interest in me yep. and a huge interest in everything that I did and I felt very comfortable there. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a great way to connect, and I think John met a, said, said a word earlier, inspirational, and he was definitely inspirational. Brilliant, man. Nice. Uh, do you, what, do you, did you ever say it to him or her? Did you ever, did you ever get it? Because I was thinking about Paul, I was like, geez, I, haven't, I never got a chance to actually say it to him. But did you ever get a chance to say, say that? 
Probably didn't say it to him, yeah. but I, I trained with a smile on my face all the time. Yeah, yeah. So I was very happy to be there. Class. Nice one. Thank you, guys. Thanks for uh, everyone who spoke, but even if you didn't, thank you. Uh, yeah, give each other a round of applause there. Um, so the reason I had a mirror on the picture, on the slides there, is that, um, you know, when you're talking about all of the coaches that, and all of the qualities that they had, all of ye are that person now. So ye are that person that people are looking to, and they're admiring your qualities, whether you think it or not, they are. Um, and what a beautiful responsibility and also opportunity that you have to impact people's sporting career, but also impact them as people and their character. But also when you zoom out, the impact that that will have on society, the ripple effect that that has on society when they're going into school, college, dating your kids, uh, managing the local companies, leading politically, like all of those in such a formative part of their lives, the impact that you're having is, uh, should not be underestimated. And um, yeah. So last thing I'm going to ask you to do is I want you to just stand up if you're up for it. And I want you to just have a look around at the rest of the people in this group right now. Just have a quick glance, quick glance. Lovely. Cool. So all of these people, all of these people that came from uh, abroad, two of you came from abroad, fair play. And then uh, all, all the four provinces, cool. So who are showing up today in the cold for the young people. Uh, I'd like you to, for, for each other, but also for yourselves, give yourselves a round of applause for uh, the great work that you're doing. Uh, yeah. And uh, thank you for listening. And uh, it was a real honor to stand in front of you. Thank you. <laughs>